804 Experts, featuring Mr. Sandless, making the world a better place, one floor at a time. The Roaring Twenties are back with James River Air's Roaring Twenties Sale. Save 20% on a new comfort system. Get a 10-year warranty, free maintenance, and take 10 years to pay during James River Air's Roaring Twenties Sale. Call James River Air. I guarantee you'll dance to Charleston. Storm Tracker 8, faster alerts, and Richmond's most accurate... JES Foundation Repair, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, and the Virginia Department of Health are proud to sponsor this special news presentation. Tonight, a virtual town hall with the leaders of our Commonwealth. Virginia Responds, your questions answered. Thank you for joining us tonight for Virginia Responds, your questions answered. I'm Juan Condi. This pandemic's affecting all of us, forcing businesses to close, schools to shut down, and it's taking the lives of hundreds in our Commonwealth. We've seen Virginians come together in these dark times, making masks for each other, collecting donations, and looking out for neighbors. The pandemic, though, continues, and we may not have reached its peak. There are 9,630 uh, 9, confirmed and probable cases tonight, with more than 1,500 people hospitalized and 324 fatalities. Now, we all have questions from when can we reopen our economy to how can we keep our kids safe? Joining us tonight for this virtual town hall is Virginia Governor Ralph Northam. Governor, thanks for being with us this evening. Juan, thanks so much for having me. Thanks to your network for, for doing this, and, and for that matter, the other networks. We have our press conferences mm -hmm. several times a week, and uh, we really appreciate you being there to, to make sure that our Virginians get accurate and updated information. And I'd, I'd also like to thank all the Virginians that are viewing tonight for being part of the solution. We're all in this together. We're fighting a health crisis and an economic crisis. And just as soon as we can get this health crisis behind us, we'll be able to get the economy back up and running and return to our normal lives. So thanks for what you're doing. Thank you for giving us access to your knowledge because we're gonna go through a whole bunch of questions tonight that come yes. straight from you, the viewers at home. Uh, a new New York Times report shows Virginia among the states with the lowest rates for testing in the country. Let's take a look here at this graphic. We have Puerto Rico with 13 per 100,000, Kentucky with 19 per 100,000. Virginia's at 23. Why have we been so low, Governor, and what are we doing to improve those numbers? Our first viewer question of the night is about, uh, well, let's answer that first, then we'll go to our viewer. Well, there are several reasons, Juan. Uh, first of all is, is the supply. Uh, we're, we're still uh, competing with other governors, uh, with other states, uh, with our health care systems for the supplies we need. And the other point I would make is that the testing uh, has been very cumbersome. Um, if you look at how this all started, we had our first case in Virginia on March the 7th. And initially, every test that we did in Virginia was sent to Atlanta to CDC. The turnaround was days. And then our state lab here in Richmond came online. Um, and then private labs, uh, Quest and LabCorp uh, being two of them. And then universities, VCU and UVA came online. Mm -hmm. And now healthcare systems have come online. So, so we're, we're getting better uh, every day. Uh, we're testing between 2,000 and 3,000 uh, individuals in, in Virginia a day. As you said earlier, we had 640 positive cases today, 24 additional deaths. So mm -hmm. this is a real situation. And in order to ease some of these restrictions, uh, we really need to ramp up our testing, probably to the 10,000, 13,000 a day range. And that will ensure all of our safety. Let's go to our first viewer question of the evening. They're asking about testing. Let's take a look here. I'm interested uh, in contact tracing. Can you tell me what your plans are for that? And is there a place where I can volunteer for that? Okay, so contact tracing. Can you explain that to the viewers, your medical doctor, and um, how we might be able to ramp that up in the future? Great, well, the, the question is about contact testing. In mm -hmm. other words, if I think I may have been in contact with someone else that, that had the virus, then where do I go for testing? And, and again, supplies have been an issue, and, mm -hmm. and we have had to use certain screening criteria uh, if someone was in contact with someone that tested positive, uh, if someone had a fever, mm -hmm. a cough, shortness of breath, because we just didn't have the, the capability, the, the capacity that we needed. But uh, we're coming, uh, coming up to speed on that. Uh, just yesterday, uh, as the viewers probably know, we, we announced a testing task force that will be run by uh, two individuals, uh, Karen Remley, Dr. Karen Remley, who mm -hmm. used to be our Commissioner of Health, and, and Dr. Peake, who is, is one of our epidemiologists. And, and we're really doing that to coordinate the testing capabilities across Virginia. 
Um, as, we've, as I've said, we've, we've had to use these criteria, but we need to reach out and, and be able to test more people. And also because it was so cumbersome, a lot of providers, a lot of the doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, have chosen just to make clinical diagnosis because the turnaround time for the testing has been sometimes five to seven days. So, so we wrote a letter yesterday to our providers so mm -hmm. that you know, our, our testing is better now, so we really encourage you uh, to do those tests so, so that we'll have more data and can better follow this virus. And there are also more efforts now to uh, be in underserved communities here Absolutely. in the Richmond area. That's a great point, Juan, and, and we, we are reaching into the underserved areas, mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that we talked about it with this new task force is even have a, a mobile testing uh, pro uh, process so mm -hmm. that we may have like a van that goes around to neighborhoods. You know, we'll announce when we're going to be there, but we want everybody in Virginia that needs it to have access to testing. That capacity, though, is on the rise. Yes, it is. Our next question comes from a young viewer in Suffolk named Shelby, who has a question about education. Let's listen in. I was wondering if you, um, what you know about the plans for the beginning of the next school year and how that's going to uh, work out for the um, Suffolk schools. Still very thank much. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, too. Still very much unknown about uh, how schools will operate as we go into the fall. What uh, sense of that do you have this evening? It's a great question, Juan, and that was probably one of the toughest decisions that, that we had to make this year, and that was to postpone schooling mm -hmm. uh, till the fall to, to, uh, to um, close our schools. And I did that because we were, we were looking at the data, uh, looking at when the peak or the uh, surge would be, um, and it still looks like it's in late April, early May, and I wanted people in Virginia to have consistency and, and certainty as we move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will tell you that our teachers have really stepped up. Um, we have a, a program called Virtual Virginia now, uh, which reaches out to, to children across Virginia. Four of the public uh, networks uh, in, in Virginia are offering uh, uh, instruction uh, on the TV. Mm -hmm. One of the points, though, it's important to make, and I hope all Virginians hear this, uh, when we talk about equity and, and being able to reach out to all children across Virginia, uh, we know now how important broadband is. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I have been working on for the last uh, several years, the funding for that. But, you know, that last mile, when, when certain children and their families have access to broadband and others don't, mm -hmm. then, you know, those, those individuals are at a disadvantage. So, so I think the caller wanted to know, what about the fall? And, and um, I can't predict uh, what's going to happen tomorrow necessarily, but um, you know, if we continue to do the things that we're doing in Virginia, the social distancing, flattening that curve, um, I am hopeful that our children uh, will be back in school uh, in late August, early September. So uh, uh, that's, that's what our goal is. We're all smiling, right? Millions yeah. of parents in the Commonwealth will smile as yeah. well when that day comes. Yeah. Our next question from Chesapeake. Bill Wright is asking about opening the economy. It does look like we have some serious hot spots uh, in the state, uh, specifically Northern Virginia and Central Virginia. And my question is, is your administration with all that data uh, talking about reopening the Virginia economy on a regional basis as opposed to an entire statewide basis. Okay, you've mentioned this before in your yeah. news conferences. What are the barriers to reopening our economy regionally as opposed to as a, as a blanket? Well, it's a great question and I, I appreciate that. And, and there are hot spots in Virginia and this virus tends to, uh, to be more successful, if you will, uh, in, in areas where there's density. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will remind folks that uh, this virus uh, knows no borders. It knows not where the counties are and even where our state borders are. So I have tried to be consistent and, and make the decisions that, that we have made on a statewide basis. As far as when we can start lifting these restrictions, uh, as people know, we have a stay-at-home order through June the 10th. Mm -hmm. Our businesses, our non-essential businesses, have been asked to stay closed through May the 8th. Um, I would love to get the economy up and running uh, before then, but we need several things. We need to make sure that we have the necessary PPE. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard us talk about that before, not only for our hospitals, our nursing homes, our first responders, those that work on the front lines in our grocery stores, for example. We want them to be safe and we want their families to be safe. We also need the testing. We talked about that a little while ago. Uh, we're ramping that up. Our capacity uh, is increasing, uh, but we need to be able to test and then track those individuals and contacts. Mm -hmm. And then if need be, we need to isolate individuals. So, uh, so when we have all that where we're comfortable, 
uh, where we can move forward safely and, and responsibly, uh, we look to uh, look forward to uh, easing some of these restrictions and, and getting people back to their lives. And this would also include, to some extent, to the extent that you've mentioned so far, regional cooperation with our neighboring states so we're not so far out of sync with what, what they do, which could mess up what we want to do ourselves. Absolutely. And I, we've had, I've had a great relationship with our, our governors in, in Maryland and North Carolina and also our mayor up in, in Washington, D.C. So we have worked closely together. We talk so times a week and and again we want to be consistent so as for an example up in in northern Virginia uh, we have the Potomac River that, that separates uh, two large dense mm -hmm. populations and so to get rid of some of the confusion we want to try as best we can to to move forward together right that that river isn't, isn't really a boundary or a border for anyone they one other thing one two, sure. two if I can add mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about uh, easing the restrictions the CDC uh, has come out with guidelines um, they were uh, uh, talked about uh, by President Trump on, on Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, three different phases. But in order to get into that first phase, we need to have 14 days of decrease in numbers of new cases each mm -hmm. day. And, and while we've seen some flattening out of the numbers over the last few days, uh, we're, we're nowhere near the 14 days. So I, again, I, I know everybody is chomping at the bit to, uh, to lift restrictions, but uh, we need to do it safely. You're waiting for the data to catch up. Absolutely. All right, summertime's almost here. It's bloom outside and lovely sunshine. So we're worried about 4th of July. Let's take a look at this question. This is a video from Beaches in Jacksonville on Saturday, about 20 minutes after they were reopened. What is the plan for Virginia beaches? Well, it's a good question, Juan. And again, we want to be safe. We, we know that this virus is spread uh, by aerosolized, aerosolized uh, particles. In mm -hmm. other words, when when people even breathe close to each other or they sneeze or, or cough. So a lot of our guidelines have been centered around keeping people the social distancing, keeping people six feet away mm -hmm. um, if there are gatherings to have less than 10. And for the most part, uh, Virginians have abided by those, and I, I commend Virginians. But when I look at pictures like the beach uh, where people are congregated and, and in close proximity, sitting on towels, blankets, uh, that's not in anybody's best interest. And so, uh, while I'd like to say by July this virus will be in our rearview mirror, mm -hmm. uh, we just have to take one day at a time. Uh, until we have a, a vaccination, which people are saying a year, year and a half, mm -hmm. I think this virus is going to continue to be out there in our communities. And, and so we all, uh, as Virginians, need to be careful and, and, and follow these guidelines. So, uh, as far as festivals, large gatherings this summer, um, I wouldn't recommend those right now. All right, well, <laughs> let's move to the stay-at-home order itself. Uh, it really is getting under the skin of many people. There have been protests, uh, one last week. It's another scheduled for tomorrow. We're looking here at video from Capitol Square last week, folks calling for you to reopen the economy and to rescind your stay-at-home order. Let's take a uh, listen here to one of the demonstrators. I would like for the governor to get the message that we're tired of tyranny. Just because other governors have also overreacted, doesn't mean he has to. All right, what would you say to folks who accuse you of tyranny? Is that a reasonable interpretation of what you're trying to do? Well, I would remind folks that uh, at my job as governor is to, to keep Virginians safe and, and to, to save lives, and, and also to remind them that on Thursday, uh, our president, uh, through the CDC guidelines, told us that uh, we need 14 days of decreasing numbers. And while I know people are frustrated, you know, I'm frustrated. We all want to get back to our, our normal lives, uh, but we need to do this in a safe and, and responsible way. So, so I don't really need protests to encourage me to, to uh, lift these restrictions. Uh, what we need right now is to work as a team. Uh, we need to put this health crisis behind us. Um, we need to, to make sure that we continue the social distancing, uh, the, you know, the, the guidelines that uh, uh, like washing our hands, good hygiene. We know these things are working. And, and why is this important? Uh, I, wanted, I, I just want to emphasize, I'm a physician. I have been on the front lines. I have been in the ER. I know what these uh, providers are going through. It is not easy. They're putting themselves at risk. They're putting their families at risk. They're tired. Uh, they're going to work every day. And I, I commend them for doing what they're doing. It is not easy work. But, but I would ask all Virginians to, to think about those people. 
uh, to, to not put those people at more risk and, and th those people and their families. Let's, let's do this as a team. Uh, as, our as our vice president told us yesterday in a, in a discussion, we had one team, one mission. That's where we need to be right now to, to get this health crisis behind us. All right. Let's move now to Andy Fox, a reporter out in Norfolk who has a few questions of his own. Hi, Andy. Governor Northam, uh, hello, and Juan, thank you very much. Governor, the first question is, governors from Georgia, Tennessee, and South Carolina are all reopening without bending the curve. Are they wrong, and if they're not wrong, is Virginia far behind? It's a great question, Andy, and, you know, I have watched, uh, again, I, I am uh, doing everything that I can to, to follow the CDC guidelines that, that came um, out of the White House on, on Thursday. You know, I, I'm, I've got my hands full dealing with Virginia. Um, I'm not going to sit here and judge what they're doing in other states, but, but speaking on behalf of Virginia, uh, I'm going to do what's in the best interest of, of 8.5 million people. I'm going to do everything that I can to keep them safe, to get this health crisis behind us and, and get our economy up and running again. And one of the things that I, I like to remind Virginians of, uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, Virginia was the number one state in this great country of ours in which to do business. Our revenue, believe it or not, in March of this year was 10.8% higher than March of last year. Our economy was literally on fire, and, and then COVID-19 hit. So um, we went into this strong, and I'm going to do everything that I can as governor to make sure that we come out of it strong, and I'm confident that we will. All right, Governor, thank you very much for that. My next question, uh, my understanding is that hospitals are no longer overrun. We have a lot of empty beds around Virginia. Is that true? And I understand that it is true. What does that mean? Great question. And by the way, Andy, I, I miss being in 757, so thanks for, for all that you do. But it is good, Juan, to be here in, in 804. It's so, okay. You can, um, you can, everybody can get a little better to governor. And, yeah, all the area codes are, are good. But, you know, Andy asked a great question. Uh, the hospitals have really cooperated. Um, we were very worried uh, and still are, are concerned that, you know, when this peak, when this surge occurs, are they going to have the bed capacity? Mm -hmm. Are they going to have the PPE they need? Uh, are they going to have the, the staffing uh, and ability to test? And, and so they have stopped all elective surgeries. And I just had a great uh, discussion uh, with our hospital CEOs uh, this afternoon and talked about when can we safely uh, reopen our, our hospitals, our healthcare systems to, to outpatient surgery, to elective surgery. And so that's a decision working with the CEOs that, that I'll probably make in the next couple of days. But we want to make sure that that uh, our consumers, our patients, uh, know that the hospitals are, are safe, uh, that if they need to go in for surgery, whether it be emergency or elective surgery, that, that they're going to be safe, they're not going to be exposed to COVID-19. So, so we're working on a plan, and hopefully we'll be able to announce that in the next couple of days, because, you know, the, the hospitals, to, to uh, eliminate elective surgeries, that affects their bottom line, mm -hmm. uh, and they're a business like everybody else. So, uh, so we want to make sure that we can get them up and running as soon as we can, and we do it in a safe and responsible way. All right, so that capacity appears not to be a problem. What other questions do you have, uh, Andy? Governor, one more. I have time for one more question. I have one more question, uh, and then I'll be out of time, Governor, and thank you very much. What is the state doing to prepare for a possible phase two of COVID-19, which some experts say will be worse than the first phase, and is it fair to say that we will be open for business by June 10th? The question is great, Andy. It's uh, what are we doing to prepare for phase two? You know, if, if we as Virginians can continue to uh, follow the guidelines, the social distancing, the, the groups of 10 or less, the, the hygiene, then we can keep that curve flat and, and hopefully let this virus move uh, away from this country of ours and, and the world for that matter. What we worry about is if, if we do reopen too soon and we have that second phase, uh, that puts a burden on our hospitals, on our nursing homes, et cetera, it could be as bad as the first one, and we would be right back to where we started. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a time when, when I ask Virginians to just be patient. Uh, let us follow the data. Uh, let us follow how many new cases there are each day, and, and just as soon as we can, we will ease these restrictions. But uh, I think all of the experts would, would tell us that if we do that too soon, we're asking for trouble. So right now we just have to keep our foot on the pedal and keep doing what we're doing because it's working.
All right, let's talk a little bit about PPE. Last week, you, thank you very much, Andy Fox. Thank Don't want to get you there. All right, our next question is about PPE. Uh, let's show you some video here. Because across the state, emergency responders and volunteers need these protective masks and gowns. You mentioned last week that was, we received our first supply from a deal the state cut uh, yeah. with, with a private supplier. Um, what is the status of our PPE this evening? Well, it's better every day. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't be prouder of, of folks in Virginia. A lot of manufacturers, are, a lot of people have stepped up and said, how can I help? How can I be mm -hmm. part of the solution? But again, just to back up, Juan, we are fighting a biological war. And we started fighting this war without the supplies we need. There was no guidance from the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we've had to do as governors uh, is we're competing with each other. We're, we're not only competing with governors, we're competing with other countries, we're competing with healthcare systems for the same supply mm -hmm. of PPE. So it has been a very chaotic and frustrating process. But we were able to, uh, to find some PPE overseas. Uh, we invested $27 million uh, last week. We got our first shipment of that. So, so the, the N95 masks, the, the gowns, the face masks, all these things we're, we're ramping up. Um, and so w I won't say that we have as much as we would like to have, mm -hmm. uh, but that process is moving forward nicely. Uh, I'm more worried right now about the testing capabilities okay. and, and the, the um, challenge of getting swabs, that type of thing. Uh, but regarding PPE, we're in pretty good shape. Are there talks about uh, stockpiling PPE for perhaps another uh, event of this sort in the future? You know, we, you learn from all of these experiences, and I think that's one thing this country will learn, that uh, we weren't as prepared as we should have been for this pandemic, and, and uh, if and when we have another one, uh, we're going to be prepared for it. There hasn't been one this serious in almost 100 years. That's right. All right, our next viewer question is coming from Andrew, who is an election official in Norfolk. With three more elections coming up this year for the state of Virginia, what steps will you be taking in order to make sure all election sites, officers, and officials are protected during this COVID-19 pandemic? All right, so you've already moved uh, one. And yes. We'll advise. Well, and thank you for doing all you do at our, our polling places. Um, so we have a uh, general election on May the 5th. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, proposed to move that to November. Uh, just because that's right in the peak uh, of uh, when we're going to see the most cases, mm -hmm. we think, in, in Virginia. And, and voting is, is just so important. And so nobody should have to uh, choose between contracting a virus and voting. So we want not only the voters to be safe, but we also want our poll workers to be safe. Many and of whom are elderly. Exactly, exactly. Great point. So, so we have proposed to move the May 5th election to the November election. There's also a primary election for the U.S. Senate and Congress men and women mm -hmm. on June the 9th. We have moved that to two weeks uh, later to June the 23rd. The legislature, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, comes back to town tomorrow, uh, um, just by coincidence, and so they will need to vote uh, on moving the election from May the 5th to, to November the 3rd. And I, you know, I hope they uh, Think about people's safety, uh, the voters, and especially, as you said, the elderly poll workers, and, and uh, support that uh, recommendation. A couple of uh, Democratic state senators want to move that May election to the end of June instead of November. I imagine you hold your position because it may not be enough time to really find our way clear. Well, and there, it's very, very complicated, Juan, mm -hmm. and I don't want to get into the weeds, but okay. um, the, the general election is different from a primary, yes. so you can't have those on the same day, and in our code, we have to wait 30 days between elections in Virginia. Oh. Yes, yeah, so uh, there's a whole lot of uh, complexities to it. We, there, and there's, there's no good answers to all this, but we have tried to take all of those into consideration mm -hmm. and really do what's in the best interest to keep Virginians safe. But the primary election is within your executive power to move at will. The general election will require the approval of the GA, which comes back tomorrow. Well, just to f c come full circle, mm -hmm. the May 5th, election, I can move that two weeks as well, okay. but that still puts us in the middle of May and it kind of defeats the purpose. Doesn't really help. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Uh, one of the most frequently asked questions we've received since the pandemic uh, began, uh, the questions, I should say, relate to firearms. Let's listen to Mitchell now from Roanoke. Why are the indoor ranges being lumped in as indoor amusements as opposed to a necessary part of safely learning how to handle and use firearms that are being purchased in our stores and other stores around the Commonwealth? Looks like he's there at a gun shop. Go ahead. Yeah, 
Yes, great question. And we, you know, we've made some difficult decisions, mm -hmm. but anywhere there's a, an opportunity, especially in a confined space, to, to have 10 or more people or to not be able to abide by the social distancing, uh, we've made that decision. So uh, right now that, uh, that uh, uh, closure is in effect through May the 8th. I'm hopeful uh, that if we continue to do the things that we're doing in Virginia, that we can lift that uh, and let these businesses get back up and running. Um, but it's not that we're trying to single out anybody. We're, we're just trying to do what's safe and responsible for Virginia. All right. Let's, let's, let's wrap this up if we can. Yes. Uh, the pandemic has brought all of these uh, horrible things uh, to our lives, a, a, a change in the way that we shop, a change in the way that we look at each other, the way we greet each other. Where in all this tragedy do you find hope? Where in all of these changes do you find opportunity? Um, what can you say to Virginians out there who may be despairing this evening? Yeah, this has been a, just so difficult for, for so many people, Juan, and, um, and people all across Virginia have had to sacrifice, and um, the sooner we can get this behind us, the better. But, you know, as I have watched uh, Virginians respond to this, uh, first of all, our, our hospital workers, our, our nurses, our doctors, the, the staff that are in there every day, protecting people's lives, our first responders, our, our law enforcement, our firefighters, uh, our teachers, uh, just the, the average citizen out there that goes and checks on their neighbors, that contributes to the food bank. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we're all in this together. And so what gives me hope is, is the response that I've seen from Virginians. And I, I'll remind them again, we live in the best state and the best country in the world, and that's why we're all proud to be Virginia. And I would just encourage everybody just to be patient hang in there we're going to get through this together all right thank you governor ralph northam for being with us this evening and answering our viewer questions it's been a great pleasure seeing you thank we you. wish you and the first lady well thank you Juan. when we come back tonight we'll talk to virginia senators mark warner and tim kane don't go away virginia responds thank a teacher sponsored by the virginia lottery visit thankateacherva.com we can stop the spread of COVID-19 in Virginia if we all do our part. Stay home. But if you have to go out, stay at least six feet away from others. Virginia's health is in your hands. Go to vdh.virginia.gov to learn more. Eight of four experts featuring Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate Base Camp. We're not only your realtor, we're your neighbor. JES is teaming up with local restaurants throughout Virginia and Maryland in our Serve and Support initiative. Our essential employees have worked so hard to continue to serve our customers during this pandemic. Every month, for as long as this pandemic continues, we will select a local restaurant to partner with us to provide hundreds of meals for our employees and their families. For us, this is more than just giving back to our employees. It's uniting local companies to support other local companies in the fight against a global pandemic. For 30 odd years, Daddy worked underground and carried his dinner bucket. Hello, friends. This is Ralph Stanley II. You're listening to one of my hit songs, Daddy's Dinner Bucket. So many people in our area relate to that song. Wolf, Williams, and Reynolds have been representing coal miners and their families for over 30 years. Give them a call at 1 800 446 0167. Across America, business owners are figuring things out, finding new ways to serve customers, connect employees, and work with partners. Comcast Business is right there with you, with a network that helps give you speed, reliability, and security, and enough bandwidth to handle all your connected devices. Voice solutions like remote call forwarding and readable voicemail, and safe, convenient installation. When every connection counts, you can count on us. Get the connectivity your business needs. Call today. Comcast Business. Have a good trip, honey. I'm feeling lucky. Window I didn't know you were getting new windows. I'm feeling lucky. Hey, RBA, today's the day to call Window World. We can stop the spread of COVID-19 in Virginia if we all do our part. Stay home. But if you have to go out, stay at least six feet away from others. Virginia's health is in your hands. Go to vdh.virginia.gov to learn more. JES Foundation Repair, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, and the Virginia Department of Health are proud to sponsor this special news presentation.
Welcome back to Virginia Responds, your questions answered. I'm Juan Condi. And I'm Constance Jones. We're now joined by Virginia Senator Mark Warner via Zoom. Thank you, Senator, for joining us this evening. Our first question is about the news that broke today. Chuck Schumer announcing a deal to help small businesses. What can you tell us about that? Well, Constance Juan, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's been a wild few weeks, and um, I think the news that came out of D.C. today was good news. The Senate passed in a unanimous way $484 billion that does two or three things. One, it replenishes the program to support small businesses. This program provides eight weeks of payroll and some overhead. And our concern early on, the, the first $350 billion of this were used up by businesses. And I was concerned that too often the businesses that might have been getting these grants had not shown economic loss. I think we've seen some of the press reports that there are some brand name public companies. That was not where this program was supposed to help. It was supposed to help, you know, the beauty salon, the barber shop. And we wanted to make sure that businesses that just didn't have connections with banks um, were getting these funds. So we we replenished the program, and that's good news. Uh, we've also made sure that small businesses, micro businesses, minority businesses will get some of these fundings with a certain set aside. So that's part number one. Part number two of the program that will be, I think, you know, passed by the Senate today, hopefully passed by the House on, on Thursday, will put $75 billion of additional funding to our healthcare systems. A lot of our hospitals who, you know, are doing yeoman's work, but many of them have actually seen a great decline in revenues because they can't do elective surgery. So we wanted to make sure hospitals, that small doctor's office that's not seeing patients right now has some support as well. Matter of fact, we had some pretty challenging news I had with a, a group of docs today that were saying that, you know, they've seen a 30% decline in infant vaccination rates, a 70% decline in young adults vaccination rates. So I would urge all of our viewers, those doctor's offices are still open. If, if you haven't gotten your child a vaccination, please do not miss that because that could be a long term, longer term healthcare problem. And then finally, what was in the plan today was um, $25 billion to help support a testing program. If we're gonna reopen our economy, which I want us to do, we've got to increase our testing capacity. And that means, you know, we need a central location, a central site where you can check how many tests in Richmond, Roanoke, um, Hampton Roads, uh, what are the tests that are about to come online. And unfortunately, the federal government so far has not provided that kind of central testing information. Um, and if we're going to get the economy reopened, and the president's asked me to serve on a task force on this, uh, we've got to make sure we've got more testing capacity. So um, this bill also would include money for that. So I think steps in the right direction. And my host is, hope is our House colleagues will pass it on Thursday. All right, Senator Warner, now the president appointed you to the committee to reopen mm -hmm. America first. What were your thoughts when you were named to the committee? And what's some of the work that you guys have already been doing? Well, you know, listen, I have many things that I disagree with President Trump on. Um, our politics are very different. But when the president asked me to serve on this kind of commission, I'm, you know, country first in a crisis like this. And my only ask back of the president was, let's make sure that decisions you make on reopening the economy are going to be based on data, are going to be bipartisan, and they're going to have to be relying on health care um, uh, recommendations. And we've had one call, and um, there were lots of folks on the call, and, you know, many members of the Senate, and, you know, I didn't get a chance to pose my question, which was going to be about testing, which I think we need to really have a federal response on. And my hope is we'll have another call, we'll have other meetings. What I don't want to be part of is simply a, a political effort um, if the president isn't going to really listen to advice um, from folks that he might not always agree with. And you know, I want the economy to be reopened, but we, you know, the, the thing that would be the worst, and I know you had the governor on earlier tonight, and I have great faith in the governor. He's a doctor. Um, he's the only governor in the, in the country that's a doctor. We need to make sure that while we want to reopen, we do this in a safe way. The president himself has said he wants, you know, two weeks of declining um, infection numbers. 
before a state goes to phase one. And unfortunately in Virginia, we've not seen that decline yet. Um, on, on a national level, New York and elsewhere, they're seeing declines in Virginia, we're not. So I wanna make sure that we see declines in Virginia. And I really, really think we need to do more on testing. You know, if, if a business is gonna reopen, I wanna make sure they can test somebody that may show signs of the virus, that we feel a level of security because the worst thing for our economy and the worst thing for Virginia would be if people were rushed back to work and they didn't feel safe and we saw another spike in the virus. I've been talking to lots of healthcare experts and that is a real concern. I think we can deal with it, but it is a real concern. All right, Senator Warner, you're a big sports fan. And again, within the context of what you just said about using data to make smart decisions about reopening our economy, uh, do you have an idea in your mind, or is there a, a, an idea in the mind of experts when it might be feasible to bring back larger sporting events, your baseball games, your football games, where many people might be sitting together at one time? Right. Well, Juan, you're right. I, I love sports. I'd love to get back in, into seeing games and, you know, how many reruns can we watch on ESPN before we go, uh, you know, and when, whether it's you know, in baseball, the fact that the Nationals were going to come back out as world champions and their season seems to be a stymied. Or, you know, I have to say, well, I, we've got a lot of great football across Virginia. As the governor that got the Hokies, the Virginia Tech Hokies, into the ACC, I've got a soft spot in my heart for them, even though I didn't go to Tech. Uh, so I would love to have that kind of, um, you know, I'd love to have that kind of sports experience again. But, um, you know, we got to be safe. And... I don't, I think it's too early to tell. I, I, I would actually hope that um, our viewers, sports fans would listen to the healthcare experts and not the politicians on this. Um, nothing would be worse than to, you know, having a sporting event because it, it appears that the, um, the site that ended up spawning not only the virus in many ways in Italy, but we, those who followed Spain had a huge, um, uh, one of the worst cases of, of all in Europe. And a lot of that may have come from a soccer match played between mm -hmm. Valencia, uh, one of the Spanish teams, and one of the Italian teams. And that ended up creating huge chaos in Spain. We don't want that to happen. So you know, when it comes, it'll, it will come, but let's, let's let the health care experts um, determine that. A data-driven decision. Senator Mark Warner, thank you very much for joining us tonight here on 8 News. Well, let me just, you know, thank you guys. Thank you. I, I know we've got lots of stations around the state. My final comments would simply be, you know, we're going to get through this. I have great faith in Virginia. I have great faith in our country. The only thing I would ask is that we all show each other a little bit of grace. These are extraordinarily hard times, economic stress, stress about the illness. You know, if we can all show each other a little more kindness, a little more grace during this period, I think we'll all be better off. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Governor uh, Senator Mark Warner. A bit of grace for all of us. Do some good. Yeah. Senator Tim Kaine has been active in Washington, securing money for small businesses. That's right. I asked him about the deal. Senator Schumer announced earlier today. I just finished a call with all the Democratic senators, and here's the basics of it. The Paycheck Protection Program, which is key for small businesses, forgivable loans, um, $350 billion, but all of those funds were used in the first few weeks. Of that amount, 40,000 Virginia businesses qualified for $9 billion in loans, but we needed more. So here's what we'll do for small businesses. We'll increase that Paycheck Protection Program by another $250 billion. We will have a $60 billion loan fund that will be specifically administered through small banks, minority-owned banks, credit unions and community banks, and an additional $60 billion through an SBA program called the Emergency Loan Program, which is $10 billion for grants and $50 million for loans. So bottom line, we're going to increase small business lending by another $370 billion. On top of that, we will also do $75 billion more for hospitals and healthcare institutions and $25 billion to have a robust federally directed testing program for Americans so we know when it's basically when we're safe to reopen the economy and get back in the community. All right, Senator, how can the federal government 
help us with testing at this point. We know the CDC is sending teams to every state in the country to assess testing concerns, but here in Virginia, there are some major issues with getting testing supplies and setting up testing sites. Now, there have been major issues since the very beginning, and this is unfortunately the United States lost six to eight weeks because the president uh, said that this was not going to be a problem, and then the CDC stumbled out of the gate in terms of providing testing. So compared to other nations, we are far behind. But in both of the last two bills, the bill that we passed at the end of March and then the bill we're likely to pass in the Senate today, there's robust additional funding for all the components of the testing, the test kits themselves, the nasal swabs, the chemical reagents that you need to be able to run the test and analyze the results. And um, we are, we are setting up uh, uh, basically a directive that the federal government establish a testing protocol and then give the American public measurable results every week about where we need to be and where we actually are. Just saying, you know, everyone can get a test when it's not true or we're doing more this week than we were doing last week isn't going to be enough. But with the passage of this bill this afternoon, uh, work that we did in the last bill and this bill together, we should have the resources to start to make sure that Virginians and others are served by a testing protocol that the United States should have. Well, Senator, what are your thoughts Senator, about your the thoughts? state of Maryland buying tests from South Korea? Well, um, look, governors have had to go out and buy equipment. Some have bought tests, some have bought personal protective equipment. In Virginia, we've had to do that, and that's been because of the lack of a coordinated plan at the federal level. Um, you know, it would have been better to have this coordinated at the federal level through the Trump administration's agencies. But when state governments got tired of waiting, they've gone out and they've made purchases. And it may be, it may be ventilators, it may be personal protective equipment, uh, it may be test kits. Um, but that was governors getting frustrated with the absence of a, 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 a coordinated response from the administration. Senator, um, the president said last night that he was stopping all immigration because of COVID-19. What's your response to this? Um, it, it is a, an effort to deflect blame from himself. Um, he's trying to suggest that immigration is the problem. It's not. The problem is, first, this is a global pandemic. It's hard for any nation to deal with it. But what we've seen from the administration was first years of systematically dismantling the public health infrastructure, including um, agencies and resources within the White House, the State Department, the CDC to help us early detect pandemics. A president who for about six to eight weeks claimed this was not going to be a problem for us when it was, and then a significant problem uh, that the administration was not able to get testing online, as was the case in other nations. The president attempting to suggest that immigration is the cause is merely an effort to deflect um, the blame that he has to hold on his shoulders as somebody who's responsible. Well, Senator Kane, what is your closing message to Virginians? Um, the closing message to Virginia is this. Look, folks are, are very, very frightened from the grocery cashiers that I work with to the small business owners I, I talk to every day. Um, and, uh, and look, we lost six to eight weeks, but when Congress started to act in early March, we have passed three, and then this week it will now be four pieces of significant legislation, aid to individuals, aid to small businesses, aid to large businesses, aid to state and local governments, aid to hospitals and the healthcare industry. And we're not done. So I would encourage people to follow the best public health advice that we're hearing at the federal level and from the governor. Do all you can to stay safe. And we're going to do all we can in Congress to try to provide the financial resources to have both testing and economic aid that people need. All right, Senator Tim Kaine, thank you for your time. All right, Absolutely. the senator also answered some questions for Virginia residents who speak Spanish. We'll be posting those answers online. And when we come back, we'll speak to Dr. Lori Forlano with the Virginia Department of Health. Stay with us. We can stop the spread of COVID-19 in Virginia if we all do our part. Stay home. But if you have to go out, stay at least six feet away from others. Virginia's health is in your hands. Go to vdh.virginia.gov to learn more home. It's where we feel most safe. At JES Foundation Repair, we've always understood this. And now, more than ever, we remain committed to supporting you by implementing new health guidelines and putting your safety first. If you have problems with your foundation, crawl space, or basement, 
We're offering one year no interest, no payment financing, and up to $500 off. So let us help restore your peace of mind to the place you call home. If I could do one thing, I'd make sure that there were more textbooks in schools. I'm a teacher. I've seen the need. But my girlfriend here likes to say, Don't just talk about it. Be about it. And we're about the 2020 census. Because... When everyone gets counted on the census, it helps inform public funding in our neighborhood for the next 10 years. <laughs> so don't just talk about it. Be about it. Complete the census online, by phone, or by mail. Shape your future. Start here at 2020census.gov. Most cops enter the job in their 20s. You jumped into the deep end. Is that a fancy way of saying I'm old? Hey, big guy. Are you okay? Yes. Yeah, I probably should Stressed before that. LAPD, drop that gun! I love this job. The day I stop giving it my all is the day I walk away. Are you up for the challenge? That's my job. The Rookie, Sundays, 10, 9 central on ABC. For 30 odd years, Daddy worked underground and carried his dinner bucket. Hello, friends. This is Ralph Stanley II. You're listening to one of my hit songs, Daddy's Dinner Bucket. So many people in our area relate to that song. Wolf, Williams, and Reynolds have been representing coal miners and their families for over 30 years. Give them a call at 1-800-446-0167. We can stop the spread of COVID-19 in Virginia if we all do our part. Stay home. But if you have to go out, stay at least six feet away from others. Virginia's health is in your hands. Go to vdh.virginia.gov to learn more. JES Foundation Repair, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management and the Virginia Department of Health are proud to sponsor this special news presentation. Welcome back to Virginia Responds. Your questions answered. I'm Constance Jones. And I'm Juan Condi. We're joined now by Dr. Loria Forlana with the Virginia Department of Health. Dr. Forlano, thank you for being with us this evening. Thanks. Our first question is about long-term care facilities. That's right. Canterbury Health Care and Rehab Center here in Richmond has had one of the deadliest outbreaks in the country. The governor put you in charge of a task force there uh, to address the issues at the long-term care facilities during this pandemic. Our viewer, Jerry, has a question for you. What have we done to improve long-term care facilities in reducing the risk of COVID-19? With over 90% of the Virginia deaths are people that are 60 plus, I really think we should focus on how to improve long-term care facilities. All right, so the question again, how are we addressing long-term care facilities, doctor? Yeah, the, the population that lives in long-term care facilities is absolutely one of our number one priorities during this COVID-19 response. The governor has shown that priority by establishing this task force. So far, in about a week's time, we've been able to expand testing to these facilities to ensure that they have access to testing for both residents and staff. We're working through some staffing solutions and support for these facilities and also helping them work through the right processes so they have access to personal protective equipment and also uh, some support with volunteers, our Medical Reserve Corps, and other supports for these facilities. We'll continue to keep close tabs on these uh, facilities around the Commonwealth, and it's just an absolute priority for us. A common practice at those facilities, doctors, doctor, is uh, sharing nurses, something Dr. Danny Avula of the Richmond and Henrico Health District said may have contributed to the spread of the virus. Yeah, what's being done about these practices? Yeah, it's definitely a complex issue. We have learned that staff are often shared between facilities, and what we're trying to do is sh ensure that there's information that's shared between one facility and another so they can talk to their staff, they can educate them about their potential exposure, exposure if they're working in a facility with an outbreak, and uh, keep and m creating a culture where those staff feel safe, sharing that information with their employers, that they can take time off if they themselves are sick. And we're working through those um, collaborations and solutions together across facilities to try to limit that practice if and where that's possible. Dr. Forlano, you've worked in many of these facilities. What's your impression on how the doctors and the staff and the residents are holding up? 
This is a really hard time for everyone, and I think the families that have loved ones in these facilities uh, are really going through just a heartbreaking moment during this pandemic. And that's why we're really trying to go all in and support these workers and their staff, their, uh, their leadership and the families all involved in these facilities to, to make sure that they have the resources that they need. All right, let's move on to the next question about testing. A New York Times report shows that Virginia was testing the third fewest people per 100,000 among all the states in the U.S. Yeah, here's a look at the rankings. Puerto Rico was doing 13, Kentucky 19, Arizona 21 per 100,000. Virginia's there at 23. Um, how are we improving these numbers, and what are the barriers to doing that, doctor? So I think what Virginia has shown is that as the situation has evolved, so has our approach to testing. Uh, our criteria has changed several times along the response. We've expanded testing to more populations as recently as last Friday, and we're adjusting to the response as it evolves. We recently established a testing task force, which is going to be focused on this issue. We look forward to the increased support from the federal government that we've learned will become available very soon. We really, uh, and the, the real message to Virginia is the capacity is increasing. It's increasing in our academic labs, our state public health laboratory, and our, pub, our commercial laboratories as well. And they're all going to work together to assure that we have the capacity that we need. All right, speaking of capacity, our next question comes from Mary in Chesapeake. Let's listen in. I tested positive for coronavirus on April the 2nd and have quarantined at home since that time working remotely. Can you please explain why those of us in the Commonwealth that tested positive are unable to retest to find out if we're negative so we can return to the workplace with confidence? Dr. Forlano, when, uh, when would be a good time uh, or, or how can we address the concern that that viewer had? Well, first of all, I'd like to... Um just say that I hope she's feeling better and recovering well and also thank her for staying home while she was sick because those are the those are really important steps to help prevent the transmission of disease. In regards to testing after you've been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, there are some situations in which that's really necessary. Um, for example, caring for a seriously ill patient in the hospital that might be going to a nursing home. Sometimes testing helps uh, give doctors information they need. Right now, especially when we have limited testing capacity, we really need to reserve those tests for those who need it the most. Um, we hope that serological testing, which is testing of antibodies, uh, will be available soon, and that will help us test people to determine if they have an immune response to the virus. So we hope that technology and capacity will be able to be available soon. Our next question, Dr. Forlano, is about modeling and the data that we're using to determine when a peak will come. Let's show you the model from the University of Washington showing that our peak should be in four days. There is also a model from the University of Virginia tonight. We're looking at that graphic here that suggests the peak will come a little bit later, perhaps during the summertime. Yeah, why is there such a difference between these models and when do you expect the peak? So different, different models obviously are showing different timelines, and the reason for that is that they make different assumptions. They may look at data slightly differently or use different variables. I think the, the important message that we're seeing in the models that we're looking at, particularly the University of Virginia model, is that the social distancing strategies that we have put into place are working. They have slowed the, the curve, so to speak. They've flattened it a little bit and pushed it out a little further. And if we keep at it, we're hopeful that the capacity of the healthcare system will remain in control. And uh, it's, it's a really heartening sign to know that the hard things that we're having to do right now are seeming to work. All right, Dr. Falano, obviously a lot of people are ready for businesses mm -hmm. to be reopened. When do you think it'll be safe to do that? It's a great question. So when can we reopen Virginia? So there are a few things that need to be in place before we move to a full phased reopening of the Commonwealth. Things like making sure we have enough testing capacity, making sure that we're seeing a decline in the number of cases over a, a pretty sustained period of time, about 14 days. We also need to make sure that our public health workforce is ready and able to do things like contact tracing and case investigations. And we also want to make sure that our health care system has the capacity to respond.
All right, our next viewer question is about keeping ourselves protected, our health protected once our economy reopens. This is Meg, a massage therapist in Northern Virginia. When the restrictions are eased, how can we, one, ensure that the increased risks to licensed massage therapists and our clients is taken into very special consideration? So again, what can Virginia residents do to make sure that they're safe when they return back to work? So what can we do to keep safe when we start reopening things in Virginia? We can continue to wear those cloth face coverings or masks that all of us have either fashioned at home or, or purchased in some way or another. I still think that's going to be an important measure to take, especially in the beginning. Uh, I think we also need to think about our gatherings with, with loved ones and friends and family and coworkers and maybe keeping those to a smaller size in the beginning. So essentially doing a lot of the things we're doing now, taking a phased approach, a paced approach, and not turning everything on right away, uh, but making good decisions about what's really necessary and what might be able to wait. And we certainly hope she gets back to work soon. People are, are losing their livelihoods. A lot of the questions that we've received, doctor, are about trying to find comparisons between the flu, the regular flu, and our coronavirus, our novel coronavirus. Yeah, we're now a month into all of this. What are some of the key differences that you've seen? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because some of these symptoms can look very similar. In the beginning, fever, body aches. Um, cough or respiratory symptoms. Some people are also reporting gastrointestinal system symptoms, nausea, vomiting, etc. Um, so in the beginning, it's hard to tell. Obviously, you can be tested for the flu, and you can also be tested for COVID-19. So that's something that can help. Typically, with the flu, you you might uh, resolve your symptoms a little sooner, but that's not always the case. So I would say just keep an eye on your symptoms. If you're having really concerning symptoms like shortness of breath, you want to make sure that you call your health care provider immediately, regardless of the cause of your illness. All right. Thank you very much from the Rich, uh, Virginia Department of Health. Dr. Lori Forlano, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us this evening here at 8 News. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for Virginia Responds. Your questions answered. I'm Constance Jones. I'm Juan Condi. Of course, we'll have this all posted online for you, WRIC.com and the 8 News app, plus our social media. Share this information with your friends. Good night. We are the strong ones, stronger together. This is a time for rising up. Being a part is bringing us closer. It's bringing out the best in us. can stop the spread of COVID-19 in Virginia if we all do our part. Stay home. But if you have to go out, stay at least six feet away from others. Virginia's health is in your hands. Go to vdh.virginia.gov to learn more.